So I am joined today by Mary, Mary Ross, consultant clinical psychologist. Hello, Mary. How are you? Hello, Edith. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good. I'm well. And thank you so much for agreeing to take part in our Criminal Law Summit. That's really kind of you. It's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. So the, the title of your uh, seminar today is, uh, is Harrowing Evidence Impacting on You. So we're going to be looking at that uh, in a little bit of depth in a minute. But really, the thinking behind that was that, um, you know, we all, I suppose, uh, suffer from stress of one sort or another. In particular, um, criminal lawyers uh, might be guilty of ignoring stress at work. And we, yeah. we all obviously know certain areas that, that can cause stress, in particular, um, particular evidence that we have to deal with, whether that be uh, relating to sexual offences or violent offences. Um, and really what we'd hope to do today with you, Mary, is just to look at perhaps the, the causes of stress, indicators that we can see that are, are, are telling us you are stressed, and how we might best be able to, to deal with that. Um, so if we could maybe just start, Mary, I'm sure a lot of people know you um, and um, know you as uh, an expert witness and have maybe seen you in court or have, have read some of your reports. Um, but what, what is it you do on a day-to-day -day basis, Mary? What are your... The lovely thing about my job is that it's very varied and, and that's something that I love. So. I suppose it's, it's probably 50% of the time it's legal work. So a lot of work with criminal lawyers. The other part is probably immigration. Right. And some um, sort of looking at people who've been involved in road traffic accidents or make, making claims for compensation. But the other half of my work is really doing what I'm going to talk about today is people um, may recognise that they've got stress or they've left it too late and the GP is saying to them, you have stress, sometimes that's about bad things going wrong in their lives. But sometimes it's simply about work mm -hmm. and the stressors involved in the work. So my job will be about meeting people in outpatient clinics or in a GP surgery. Uh, they will come to me, we will help to work through and identify how did you get here, what caused these, this problem and probably go back over like where there warning signs that you missed so that we can do something about that in the future. And then working at strategies as a way for moving forward in, in a proactive way. So a lot of my, well, 50% of the work is clinically based, actually seeing people who have suffered from stress, anxiety, depression, PTSD, bereavement, those kind of things. The other half will be about doing assessments for criminal lawyers or lawyers involved in immigration. Okay. So... Uh a wide um, range, I suppose, of yeah, different, yes, different kinds yes. of people's stresses. Yeah. But it kind of all connects because you, even when you're doing the legal work, it, you know, it has to rely on your clinical work and the clinical research and, and your clinical experience. Absolutely. So looking at it then from a criminal lawyer's point yeah. of view, and you know, Mary, the types of um, oh evidence that we, we have yeah. to do. I mean, I, I know myself, the first, um, I think the first big um you know, sexual, it was a paedophile ring case and that, I remember that affecting me for months and months after and it was the ruminations about thinking back to the evidence and all sorts of horrible things that you just can't yeah. get out of your head. Yeah. First of all, that type of evidence, when we are subjected to that, and that's part of our job, but when we're subjected to that, what kind of effect does that have on our brains and bodies? Well, I mean, you've heard me talk a lot about PTSD, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to court, which is means you've directly experienced a trauma. Right. The kind of thing you're talking about, where it's in criminal cases, whether you are reading evidence, you know, maybe witness statements or reading police reports or social work reports, or you're having to look at horrific images mm -hmm. or listen to clients during consultations telling you dreadful stories, or maybe you have to watch video footage or things like that. All of that is still trauma, but it's you experiencing it indirectly. Okay. So even just the fact of listening to someone telling the details of a horrific crime, um, even for those who have committed those crimes or having to discuss what happened, because a lot of those people also become traumatised. So you may be having to look at witness statements about what happened. You're looking at photographs. You may be looking at video footage. And every human being has to be affected by that in some way because it alters your view of the world. Mm -hmm. 
it suddenly what maybe you thought was a world with a, a reasonably safe place where people be, mostly behave pretty well. Um, it becomes almost like this is a dangerous world we're living in. I remember when I, you know, my practice at first was all clinical. Mm -hmm. Very gradually, I became a bit more involved in criminal cases. And I can remember even with me, my, my children growing up, getting to teenage years and thinking, oh my God, I can't let them go out into town because every case I have, something bad happens to somebody who goes into town. Yeah. And a guy I treated to had been a, a, an older middle-aged man who'd gone into town for a Christmas night out, had got assaulted. And I was thinking, he's worried about this. He's had trauma and I'm actually not any help to him because I'm also thinking, yes, town is a very dangerous place. Mm -hmm. But through working with him, I got him to do a target to say, go on to video cam footage of Glasgow City Centre at two and three in the morning and have a look and come back and report to me what you see. Well, he brought all this footage and what you could see were people having fun, mm -hmm. people having a nice time. And just by chance, I had to go and collect one of my children from town early hours. And I actually saw people dancing and laughing and having fun with the police. And I thought, do you know what? I have become traumatised to some degree by the information and the loading of mm. that trauma information. And I realised very quickly, I need to change that because the world is not the dangerous place or such a dangerous place. So that kind of trauma is an indirect, you've not experienced it yourself, you've not had something terrible, although we'll look at that in a minute because you may also have had, but we call that vicarious trauma or sec you know, secondary traumatic stress. Yeah. So it's not, it's not post-traumatic stress disorder, but you do, there is the risk that you could start to experience. You talked about ruminations, mm. being unable to switch off from the details or being unable to switch off. Also, you know, you may find that in some kind of way you tend to overwork because it's a way of coping. Like I need to do more about this case because it's so important. So those kinds of things, that would be one of the early warning signs mm -hmm. that you're not able to get rid of the ruminations or you can't stop talking about it. Yeah. You find everywhere you're going to, oh my gosh, we've got this terrible case and mm -hmm. you're telling the details. So you're actually constantly traumatising yourself by the amount of times you talk about it and think about it. So your profession in particular is one of the professions which has a very high risk of this vicarious trauma or secondary traumatic stress. Okay. And you spoke there about, uh, in your own situation, that you know, you're continually being uh, exposed to these situations. Yeah. So in terms of um, how it affects you, is, it, is the frequency with which you're dealing with evidence like that, does yeah. that have more of an impact? Yes, I mean, that's it exactly. You've actually hit the nail on the head. All the research says it's the frequency okay. rather than the duration. Right. So I want to spend a couple of hours, which I would normally do preparing for a report, and all the information's going in at the one time. I may go down and have a coffee or take a break, but it's not about I look at it every single day. Mm -hmm. Also, if you've got lots of cases at the moment, and I don't know whether it just feels like this or it's actually happened, but with COVID-19 restrictions, all the work I'm doing from my sitting room. And, and in some respects, I have to say, they've been positives. You've not the commute time. It gives you more time for other things in your personal life. But on the other hand, it becomes very intense. Mm -hmm. And at least twice a week, I have had a case since the beginning of COVID restrictions dealing with sexual trauma and sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I'm just about to take a break. It does, a few weeks ago I had to say, I'm finding this too much. Yeah. It's, it's you know, the detail that's how you're having to read and then I have to read all of that, prepare the introduction beforehand. Then I have to interview the client and you're having a mixture of empathy but partly not wanting to re-traumatise them but having to listen to the detail over and over and over again. And after a while for anybody, that kind of becomes too much now. The difference between my profession and other professions and your own is that in our training, we are told that that is a possibility of the kind of work that we do. So even if I didn't do any work with criminal lawyers or worked in immigration cases, a very big part of my clinical work would be exposure to people who have experienced trauma. So you may have somebody who's referred who has had a child who has been murdered, you may have somebody who's been sexually abused and you do have to go through the details. Um, at first you can skim over them, but then part of the therapy is about they really have to relive what happened as a way of getting over. So we are taught from the word go that it is absolutely normal 
mm-hmm. and acceptable to experience this vicarious trauma. Whereas I'm not aware of that being true for lawyers, particularly criminal lawyers. So okay. I think we often, if you look at the police, first responders, uh, the military, people who are doing humanitarian work, journalists, um, all of them have now got as part of their training that this could happen to you. Mm-hmm. And not only that, it is about saying, well, you need to be responsible for you and you need to take good care of yourself. But more than that, it encourages a working environment where it is perfectly acceptable to put your hand up and say, I can't get rid of the images or I'm finding this too much. So in my profession, for example, we would always have clinical supervision. Mm -hmm. And during the clinical supervision, you would use that opportunity to discuss that. And if there were warning signs, for example, not sleeping, you know, not being able to get rid of the intrusive thoughts, images of it or um, conversations about it, Um, even things like we sneaky things like maybe taking a bit more wine as a way of numbing the effects of that or turning up late for meetings or phoning in sick. These are kind of warning signs that you're avoiding. Mm -hmm. Things like I I spoke the last time about this, the classic symptoms of stress, physiological, you know, just feeling my tummy churning, uh, heart rate, feeling constantly exhausted, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe burning on a short fuse concentration going out the window, just been a bit more on edge, a bit more hypervigilant or jumping. All of these kinds of things start to say something's wrong. And one of the hallmark signs is when you start to avoid friends, make excuses, too busy, too tired, not engaging in the activities that you used to engage. So we would be well versed that we have a personal responsibility to look for those signs in ourselves and then to actually do something about that. And part of the, the doing something about it is we would know about trauma. There mm-hmm. would be good opportunities for trauma training. But the biggest thing that you have to do is to do your own risk assessment. Mm-hmm. You have to, before I would go into a case or if I was taking on, like, you know, work in a criminal case, I have to kind of assess what's the damage that could be done to me here. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you, you, if you know one of the articles I read was to say, that see any of the information that you're going to have that could have a traumatic element as a dose of radiation. Okay. You don't want to over-radiate yourself. So you may have to decide which bits are absolutely necessary to get into detail with which bits are not. Some of the things that, that, that they talked about in the research was if you're having to look at pictures, to train yourself not to look at the face. Right. Look at the clothes or look at... Only what you have to look like in an in, at an injury, mm-hmm. look around the room. But the minute you look at the face, you've have got a personal connection, which is actually more traumatising. So there are those kind of things, that like, am I going to have to look at images, which is a bigger risk? Well, I have to look at video footage. Mm-hmm. And the thing about any video footage, if there is sound, that is much more traumatising. So you need to ask, is it necessary to listen to the sound or can I actually just look at what's happening without it? I think there are various ways. I'm not, you know, uh, computer savvy, but there are ways of kind of slightly fading the image so it's not just as graphic. But these are things that you need to do is a proper risk assessment. How much damage could this cause? And if I had three cases like this before, do I have control about spacing these out? Sometimes we don't. In our work, and we just have to be wise and say, okay, if I can't space it out, if there's a big risk, I need to boost the other parts of my life, like self care. I need to be more connected with other people. I need to get supports lined up. So we need to learn from other professions, like mental health professionals, first responders, people who are involved in uh, general medicine. And I think co- during COVID 19, all of us. We're much more aware. We, I mean, everybody kept talking about trauma. Everyone kept talking about, you now we need to keep ourselves safe, but we also need to think of our mental health. People were very, very good at doing that. We stood on our doorsteps and we applauded those who were working in care homes, the police, anyone who was exposed. But what was brilliant was because we're all trained for this and we do the risk assessments, almost immediately psychologists were called to set up hubs way before the kind of lockdown where Mm -hmm. during working hours, out with working hours, every frontline worker was informed. There were notices everywhere. You can call any time of the day or night Mm -hmm. and we will listen. Yeah. So right away you're saying to people, you're not abnormal. 
there's nothing wrong with you, it's perfect, separate. And I think the media got right behind that too in saying, look what these people are exposed to. Mm. Even with relatives who were exposed, and now we are told that anyone who has any complications due to COVID-19 in terms of psychological consequences, they would be prioritised. Mm. And I, I think, I mean, I, I'm not a criminal lawyer, clearly, clearly only you could know this with your involvement, is that I, I don't think you're trained first of all, to say it's actually okay to experience these signs and symptoms. It means I'm a normal human being with feelings. I think that's the difficulty with criminals yes. in that, you know, as you were explaining, Mary, um, you as a psychologist, you know the, the, Ill, you know, the, the consequences of looking at certain yes. things, listening to certain things. But yes. alongside your ability to help others, you also have that kind of self-protection trained into you as well. Whereas we as criminal lawyers, it's kind of like, well, just you go on. That's what you've chosen to do. Get on and go on with it. And, you know, I do. I remember actually in that particular case that following that horrific, horrific trial, I mean, I still think back to now, because oh, I'll give you a um, Everybody was offered counselling from... Oh, great. To the well, I think the crown perhaps have their own um, facilities or, or certainly assistance there. But the, the the Scottish Court Service staff were offered counselling. Everybody except for defence counsel and solicitor. Oh gosh! And you think, well, you know, what what? How do they think we're supposed to deal with this? And wow! Um, so a very unusual situation where they are acknowledging the potential for traumatisation. Mm -hmm. but saying only certain groups will get it, which is almost kind of no more damaging and reinforcing this notion that you should just cope. Yeah, exactly. And um, I mean, I think we'll, we'll talk about some resources that people can. Sure. Um, sure. But um, from what you're saying, um, perhaps it's just an awareness amongst criminal lawyers that to say to colleagues or just to acknowledge to yourself, yes. I'm coping with this, um, this evidence and it's, it's normal not to cope. It's probably abnormal if you are coping. Um, you may yourself more. So, I mean, would you promote, uh, and we can talk about uh, various services that are available to us, but um, would you encourage people to speak to colleagues about it and just normalise the feelings that people have as a result of looking at these sort of things? Yeah, I mean, the starting point has to be about, first of all, you acknowledge it in yourself. Mm-hmm. And that, it may be just tiny symptoms, like I'm not sleeping just as well, and I'm dreaming about this during the night. It's the first thing I'm thinking about when I get up. And I think the very first point of, of it should be like anyone you trust that you could actually say it to. So even if it isn't, you know, in terms of someone professional or, or a peer, just anyone. It could be a friend that you absolutely trust and you don't need to get into the detail of what you've seen just to be saying, I'm involved in quite a harrowing case here and it's just a Mary, when I don't, know, I, I don't like to speak to me. I, I say to people, you don't want to know what it was. So yeah. they realise that another difficulty, you don't want to traumatise somebody else. So, But you, you say just talk, just yeah. verbalising the fact you're struggling with whatever it is without having to express it. For for example, I think you can still say to someone that I'm actually having to look at harrowing evidence Mm. and just say, I'm going to let you use your imagination. You know, you've you've watched films, you've you've seen things about this where you can just imagine Mm -hmm. the kind of images I'm having to see, the, the stories or the statements that I'm having to read. And I think people would get an idea. I mean, one of the parts of my job is to work with the police because they have identified that those police officers are having to look online at images Mm -hmm. that maybe formed part of a case are, again, very likely to become traumatised. So it really is about, they would never actually, in fact, usually if I go into the room and the screens are all on show, it's like Mary's coming and it's like screens are covered or they're dimmed so because they don't want me, I don't have to see these images, so why would I want to be exposed to them? I've got a pretty good idea of what they're looking at. And when they see me one-on-one, you know, they will kind of say it really was a high-level one or a low-level or it involved this or it, I made a connection because it was a child of the child, I've got a child of that age or something like that. So you get the gist of it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's in the kind of telling, just simply kind of look, can I just flag up 
my work is not straightforward. It is, at times, it can be quite demanding of me emotionally. And that could be just, you know, other parts of our work we accept, we get tired, we're busy, we've got lots of demands. We accept that and we looked at that the last time, how to cope with that. But this is a very specific thing. You know, if we're hearing awful stories, um, and usually if I would come out of a clinic, I mean, I'd probably look quite white and quite drained. So somebody might say, are you all right? And just because that was a pretty tough case. So I can't disclose because of confidentiality, yes. but I could come home. Clearly the rules about confidentiality. I can't say the details of the case in case the person's identified, but I could say, oh my God, it's a this type of case. I had to listen to that. So I think that can be enough. Now, with your colleagues, they might have an even better understanding. Do you remember such and such a case? It's like that. Yeah. There are images. And I think that informal, just I've had a hard week, I've had several cases like it. That must be the first point of call. And then it may not even need a big, deep conversation. It's the saying it. It's then bringing in the resources. It could be humour. It could be like, are you taking time out? Are you remembering, you know, just, you know, have a dose and then don't have a dose for a couple of days? You know, you don't want to frequently dose yourself with these traumatic images, but it really is you acknowledging it for yourself and somehow having some acknowledgement from some other person is the very first starting point. Okay. At which point then would or should somebody seek professional help, like coming to, to meet with you or something like that? I, I, again, if you look at um, the Lockerbie disaster and big disasters like that, um, you're probably too young to even remember that. I have quite a very vivid memory of it. And there seem to be um, all these, you know, right, let's get the psychologists in, let's get the counsel. Everybody who had any counselling background will all march in and we're going to speak to all these police officers, first responders, and, you know, the people who were affected by that. And what we now know is that's actually very damaging. Okay. So the timing of when you come in with the help is very, very important because... Although we can be exposed to this trauma indirectly and we may develop some of these signs and symptoms, I'll look at those in more detail in a minute, we actually are copers and we need to give ourselves credit. And you will know that. I mean, all the cases you've dealt with, you have coped. So we need to allow ourselves to bring in our own adaptive coping mechanisms. And very often within six weeks, you find it all starts to settle and go back to where you were before you started to look at the images. So we need to allow, so sometimes I will get referrals and it's such and such has just happened and we need you to come in and see them and be like, no, I, I will listen to what's happened first, just very brief details. I'll say, what I'm going to do is get in touch with you in six weeks time. If you're still feeling this way, then we can set up some appointments. So you need to allow a time for just normal coping and that's when you're doing things like right, engaging in more activities that make you feel good. Even reading about this, about educating yourself, although we know that just education about it is not enough. It's got to be about being trained and looking at the risk factors and making sure you're engaging with other things, getting rest, getting out of the office, having a bit of a laugh. These things are important. So you would allow the dust to settle. Now, if after that you are finding, do you know what, this is not shifting. So when we're looking at trauma, there are three aspects to trauma. The very first one are symptoms of intrusion. And you mentioned the very first one at the beginning, rumination. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I can't get this out of my head. So it might not even be the image. It's just like, I can't stop thinking about this case. You know, it's the, I go to bed at night and it's running around my head. I'm waiting in the middle of the night and I'm wondering what I'm going to do next. Get up in the morning is the first thing. That's not really very helpful to you and it's not a great sign. If there are images that you've seen or things that you've read or video footage that's going over and over in your head after the six week period, that isn't great either. If there are things that are reminding you of it, if there are places you'd rather not go because it's a reminder, that's the first lot of symptoms. The next lot are to do with avoidance. So if you find that you're now disengaging with people, not being connected, mm -hmm. even with your peers, you're like shutting yourself in the room and like, I'm very busy, got loads of work to do, you're not going in for a coffee, not meeting people, not even engaging in your leisure activities, that's not a great sign. Mm -hmm. If you're also not, you're aware that you've got a lot of feelings, but you're not actually doing anything to deal with it, like things like I said, like turning up late, being a bit disorganised, phoning in sick, these are warning signs, all is not well. And then the final 
group of symptoms are more about hyper arousal. So it's like your radar is away up. So your body's reacting. So your physiological symptoms like the heart rate, sweating, churning tummy, irritability, you know, sometimes not really for any good reason. Mm -hmm. Concentration, getting that brain fog, I can't quite focus on things. Sleep disorder is one of the classic signs of trauma. Hypervigilance, been a little bit more wary of danger than you should be and just kind of jumping, getting a wee bit frightened. So when you put those three categories together, you know, if you're finding, oh, I do have a lot of these going on, nothing seems to be shifting then, then I think it is worth thinking about looking for help. But we don't really want you to get there. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an awful lot could be done proactively in terms of risk assessment, setting up trauma training, having an environment where everyone has been on training about trauma, creating an environment where, right, what do we do when someone's showing these signs? We create an atmosphere that says, let's talk about this, let's get together, let's look at what we could do to help. We would never want people to get to the end process of having to see us. Now, sometimes when you are looking at evidence or you're hearing about a case, say there's a trauma, you may have experienced that trauma in your past. So you've got a personal connection Mm -hmm. to that trauma and it may be bringing up something from your past that isn't resolved. So that would also be a warning sign. We said, you know what, this may be the time Mm -hmm. to address this problem. I think I'll go to seek professional help. But the the sort of resources that I, I was actually quite surprised um, that the resources that were there, the one that I'm just looking at there was Claiming Space, mm-hmm. which I never heard of. And it is set up. There was a lawyer who did some training in psychology. Mm-hmm. And I think there's also a barrister. And this is a free service. And they do online trauma training. Mm -hmm. And they get people to come together and they teach about, you know, what's important in terms of professional and peer support. You know, it can be done informally and uh, formally. How you need Mm self-care is important. Taking time out for reflection, doing the risk assessment, re-engaging with your life, making sure you're eating well. And I think that if people are aware of that, first of all, I know it's a great resource, then you could actually opt in to do online sessions. Mm. Now, if when you do those online sessions, you realise that actually I think I do need professional help, they can direct you to that and then and then you get... But very, very few people would need to go on mm. to get the professional help if we put in place the things that are necessary, that are already there for a lot of other professional groups and that build resilience. And yeah. that's the thing that seems to be missing in in the training of criminal lawyers is that there's not an acknowledgement that this can happen. Mm -hmm. And then there is not the kind of setting up what would be useful in terms of preparing people for this and for avoiding foreseeable psychological consequences. And I think that's where the failing is because no one should have to experience the level of trauma that would involve the need for professional help. No, absolutely. And I think what we've done as criminal lawyers and, you know, we'll, you'll hear people say things like, oh, well, I've, you know, I thought I'd seen it all and then I saw this and I couldn't, you know, yeah. you know down to a different level. And we yeah. very much use humour um, and that oh, yeah. dark humour, whatever, but that is, that's obviously a coping mechanism. But I think you're absolutely right, Mary. There's definitely not just scope for, but an absolute need that we 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 are trained in trauma, not only in recognising it, but recognising it in ourselves and dealing with it and getting help to cope with it. We obviously, we have got, as I say, those coping mechanisms, which are humour, you know, and people out with the profession, would, if they heard some of us speak, might think, goodness, they are laughing at those things, but that's is a, is a mechanism to cope, isn't it? I think in every profession, we always say that in our staff rooms, you know, you're never laughing at someone or a situation. But you have to develop a way of black humour mm-hmm. uh, to keep the thing light. And I think usually when one of us is doing that, we're recognising you're having a bit of a hard time with that. You're trying to make it light. And, and all the colleagues would join in. Absolutely. But there has to be that collegial support, mm-hmm. which says, you know, it's perfectly normal to experience that. But if that were part of the training, yeah. then people would know that in advance. We don't know where the resources are. Even the one that I mentioned the last time, Law Care, yes. when I looked at their website, they actually had a brilliant handout uh-huh. on this vicarious trauma. 
And I was like, this is so good. And they're linked up with the, the claiming space um, so that they both work together for providing these services. And I don't know, I mean, is that well known that these are available? I, I doubt uh, I doubt it is well known and if, if it's not then I think we definitely will we'll certainly put links to this on our, our summit um, but I think it's probably something that needs to be taken forward with both the Faculty of Advocates and also the Law Society because um, I suspect that most people are not aware of it or have only become aware of it when they've become quite ill as a result of of this so um, those certainly those two resources uh, look really helpful and we should be utilizing them in training people we know we're, we have to do certain it's suspended at the minute for um, for reasons of the lockdown etc but we have to do continuing professional development so I think um, yes. that that's essential that we we include self-care in the form of, of um, awareness of trauma trauma training and I think one of these, I think it was the claiming space, say that they can link you. If you were experiencing these, they could link you with a lawyer who had experienced the vicarious trauma and had got through it. Mm -hmm. And you could chat about it and, you know, different ways that they've got through it, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. Because the only way we can do that is peer-to-peer -peer support. Absolutely. I mean, I can learn from people, you know, who have, I mean, I'm nearing the end of my career, but I can learn from people at any stage to say, I do this. You think, gosh, I've never thought of doing that before. But again, it's just it's getting rid of any shame yeah. to do. And, and I think if the legal profession takes this seriously and says, like we do, and like first responders in the training do, is to say, you are at increased risk. Mm -hmm. Now, when I work with the police, one of the things that we got them to do is to sign a form to say that they take responsibility for themselves. Right. So that I'm not a mind reader. Yes, I've got psychological <laughs> skills, but if you choose... Not to and I can sometimes guess that yeah. someone is with, well, I can guess what it is they're withholding, uh -huh. but that's not a way to do a job. They, you have to take responsibility that if I am seeing you in a proactive way three or four times a year because you're at risk of looking at these images, mm -hmm. when you come in to see me, we don't just have a friendly chat. Yeah. You can have a friendly chat if there's nothing else going on, but if you've noted that there are certain things that you're going on, you're a bit traumatised, very often I get that when a police officer, somebody, you know, they have had or their wife or partner has had a baby. And it's like suddenly, oh my gosh, this work becomes much more real. Mm. I could do this when it was away, far away. But mm. now I have a child. This is too much. So mm. if they even start to tell me that kind of thing, we say, okay, the risk has just gone up. So mm. what are we going to put in place? Who are the other guys on the team who have children? What have they used before? Mm -hmm. Let's start, at least let's start putting this into the, our discussions when we meet. But ultimately, the responsibility is a personal responsibility for self-care. Mm -hmm. So if you don't own it, if you don't acknowledge it for yourself, you can't do the next step of saying to someone, you know, this is happening. And then hopefully if they're owning it, they'll say, I had that last year, I had that last month, right, come on, we'll go for a coffee. Mm -hmm. But it is about, you know, reflecting looking for the warning signs, which you can only do if we're having a discussion like we're having today, if you're directed to websites, if it's part of your training, say, these are the warning signs. If you see them too often, they've not gone after six weeks of being exposed to this, you need to do something about it. Informally, go onto these websites, connect with the people who know what they're doing, and then if not, they'll be advising you at some stage to seek professional help. And that doesn't mean you failed either. It just means something's going on. It could be something from your past you're connecting with, but you may need to learn specific techniques to get rid of the trauma. Absolutely. And I suppose as well, just being aware of our colleagues and looking out for changes yes. and yes. Um, yes. pointing, maybe pointing out to people that, that don't want to admit, because I think there, there certainly is a kind of, um, you know, people, I, I can imagine people are reluctant to admit to things because they, they will see it as a failing. Well, they've been given this this case, so they should be able to deal with, with whatever it is. But we're not robots. We all have feelings. We all have emotions. We all have feelings. And that then, you know, we don't want our work making us ill because that then has the effect of not being able to do our work or doing it properly. So it's very much, I think, just identifying it and helping ourselves and helping others, isn't it? I think sometimes people won't let us 
express that, you know, especially if you're a criminal lawyer, it's like I think you're, you're, you're strong, you get up there, you do all this work. And it's, you know, even if I work in a multidisciplinary team, you know, people will constantly feel to you, oh, you're always strong, you're always positive, you're always like, no, I'm not. <laughs> so it's very hard when that's your role and that's the way you have to be seen when you're doing your work to actually come out of your room and say, oh my God, help, cheer uh-huh. me up or make me laugh. And very often that's what I would do. If I'd had several cases in a row, I would pen down, lock the door to the staff room and inevitably we have crazy, just stupid conversations that make you laugh. You think, right, I'm ready to go back and face this again. But you really, we have a duty to educate people to say, me too, I get this. You know, there are all these adverts in television about mental health awareness, but we do need to start saying, even those people that you think are coping at the highest level and are, we also are parts of our job that can make us vulnerable to trauma. Definitely. Well, Mary, that has been so interesting and so educational and just even bringing that awareness to law, criminal lawyers out there that they need to deal with it, that they're not, we're not all made of tough stuff and no, no failure to not be able to cope because, you know, it, I think it, it's indicative of a, an empathetic normal human being not to cope with with being bombarded with these horrific things i mean we deal with the most horrendous um aspects of society and it's not normal to just brush ourselves off and get on to the next one um so that's been incredibly helpful and i'm sure will resonate with a number of people um and as i say we'll link in um the resources that you've provided and also your details mary if anyone feels that they've, they've actually got the point where they need some professional help. Um, But once again, Mary, thank you so very much. You've been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.